Well, hello, and welcome back to the uh, Lessons of Vietnam. I want to apologize to you who tuned in last show and there was no show. Uh, I was still laid up with a uh, back operation and a uh, little communications uh, situation there. But I do want to thank uh, Paul White and Dave Samuels for sitting in uh, the day I had my operation uh, for that show. I appreciate them sitting in uh, for me because I was in definitely no condition to do the show back then. Uh, tonight's show is uh, Vietnam War and the American Warrior, the things we endured. I uh, hope you enjoyed. I encourage you to have, uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, call in. If you're going to call in at 919-518-9773, or even better, uh, log in on, on your computers to computers. 2K Voice on Skype. Uh, that's 2K as in Kilo uh, Voice. Tune in and, uh, and, and make your comments and so forth. Uh, the things we endured, I couldn't cover everything in one show, so um, you can call in. If we give me enough other information about other things that uh, we can talk about, uh, we'll do that show. Uh, if you want to make comments uh, for uh, later, uh, email address is lessonsofvietnam at ncvvi.org. Just send me an email, and uh, if you want to be on the show or make comments or whatever you want to say, just send me an email and so forth. So i uh, got a lot to go over tonight, and uh, again, I appreciate you tuning in and uh your show is very important, so I hope that uh, uh, those of you who t uh, missed the show last month because of, or last uh, two weeks ago because there wasn't one, it wasn't because we weren't interested. I just was not in a condition to um, uh, come in and do the show. I just uh, I got released yesterday by my uh, in-home uh, nurse, uh, physical therapist, and that I could get out a little bit, so uh, here I am tonight. Now, what I want to talk about a little bit tonight is... Uh, People think about war, and they see the movies and so forth. But let me tell you, it's, uh, for those of you who haven't been involved in war at all, uh, a war is not a pretty thing. It's nasty. It's dirty. It's gross. See, when you shoot somebody during a war, they don't go, oh, I've been shot in the arm, and get up and go on about it. Uh, uh, they fall down, and some quite often uh, stay down. And putting this show together, I found this, and I want to read it to you. Uh, I hate the reading what's on the uh, uh, screen, but I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, what has not changed over the centuries is the profaneness of war. The frustration of returning to a society preoccupied with mindless, vicarious thrills seeking enthralls by reality shows. The loneliness one feels even in the midst of a crowd. The terror of the unexpected sight or sound or smell. The rage so easily triggered and the profound disquiet of the wounded soul. Everybody had heard about Vietnam veterans coming back and uh, a certain smell or a backfiring of a car and the, the funny things they did uh, or as, as reaction to that. Uh, it's not really funny. It may be funny to people who have not been through the situation, but um, uh, that kind of gives you an idea. From the highly uh, varied, always dirty, but brilliant hues coloring the edge of life in the war zone to the drab, gray, Sameness of existence at home. Is a transition hard to make? Many never do. I was lucky. I survived the war, but at home my existence was sometimes touch and go. Would you hear the saying all the time, when were you in Vietnam? Well, I was there last night. Uh, it never really leaves you. If you're in a war zone, uh, whether you're a combat soldier or whatever, it changes your life. Uh, you ain't the same person that comes back that went over there uh, to wherever it is, uh, uh, there's changes. Uh, you see things, uh, endure things, and so forth. Lessons learned in the war zone, detachment, vigilance, control, anger, were habits not compatible with home. That's why a lot of soldiers came home and were married and got divorced. They came home, uh, their girlfriends or whatever, all of a sudden realized that they weren't the same person uh, they had trouble with jobs and so forth, which is why a lot of guys came home and girls came home and just didn't tell anybody they were Vietnam veterans because, first of all, most people didn't care and the stigma of being a Vietnam vet. Now, this is, um, 
many of people look at war and it's like watching TV and it's a game. You know, nice and clean and orderly. You got a board there and so forth. But I can tell you, it's not. There's nothing clean. There's nothing orderly whatsoever about a war. And our next picture, this gives you the idea of what the price of war is all about. Uh, our country has had a lot of wars uh, here and, and, and going to other countries. And we hear it all the time, the cliche, uh, freedom is not free. Well, this is what the price of war is all about. Uh, those young men and women who come home in those flag-colored caskets and so forth. As you can see from the next slide, there's nothing clean and orderly at all about it. Young men with a lot of potential uh, go and give their life for our country. And any time that you are out, always remember the families. Uh, this young man who's laying there covered in a poncho, uh, probably had a mother and father, a girlfriend, wife, and what would they have become? I mean, what kind of social problem could they have solved? The, the you know, cure for cancer or whatever, uh, the life snuffed out and so forth. When you look at war, it's raw, it's dirty, it smells bad, and anything but orderly. Now, you see these people, they're in mud, they're wounded, they're on a mountain, it's not like they could go take a bath today when they get through and get on with it because there's no place to take a bath. That mud will be with them on their uniforms uh, for whenever weeks, two weeks, whenever they get a new uniform and so forth. So it's, it's not a movie. It's not a TV show. It's real. Now, sometimes people tell me, uh, in fact, I had I was speaking into a high school one time, and a guy said a young man came up and said, "Now y'all were fighting farmers. There's guys out there in the field plowing their fields all day, and at night they picked up these old guns and came out here, and that's how you were fighting." Well, let me tell you really what it was all about. The Viet Cong, which is Vietnamese communists or the guerrillas, uh, this is a picture of some of them wearing their black pajamas and so forth. Most of these guys were well-trained soldiers. In fact, most of them had more experience than a lot of our own soldiers because most of these guys uh, had fought the French. Some had fought the Japanese. Uh, so they were all well-trained. fighting. They were Viet, the Viet Minh fighting the French and so forth. Uh, by day, yes, they were guerrillas, and they were uh, plowing in, in the rice paddies and going about their day, and they did pick up their weapons and came back. Now, originally, when they came in to fight quite often, they did have old weapons, but then the uh, communist North Vietnamese uh, government started to send down weapons and so forth. And then we had the People's Army of Vietnam, which was the North Vietnamese military. Uh, as you can see there in the pictures, they had uniforms. They wore their pith helmets. Uh, Quite often, they had as good or better equipment than some of the American units they were fighting, and a lot of the soldiers uh, did have more experience than some of the uh, soldiers they were sending over. Now, let's talk about now or uh, the tour of duty. Uh, in Vietnam, it was a little different than some of the other wars we fought. In uh, Korea and uh, World War II and other wars, you went over to fight, and you were there pretty much for the duration. Uh, there wasn't no 12 months, and you come home. And for the Vietnam War, they decided to, uh, you t a tour of duty was either were from 12, to, uh, 12 months or 13 months, 13 if you were Marines, 12 months for everybody else. And that had its advantage and disadvantages. When you went over to Vietnam, you knew that you served a year, you could come home. That was a good advantage. But the problems were when you first got to Vietnam, you didn't know what you were doing. People left you alone because they were afraid you are going to get yourself and them killed. And then you got really good at what you were going to do. And then you got short and ready to come home. Then you got real careful. So probably out of the 12 months, you were good probably anywhere from six months uh, maybe eight months of actually being a good top soldier before you came back home. So in the 10 years or so of the Vietnam War, we had one year's experience 10 times. And the thing about it was, some of the young lieutenants who went out in the field, 
who became good leaders were rotated back to the uh, base camps to serve as uh, uh, different functions back there in intelligence and so forth. So another second lieutenant would come out green and start all over again and learning. So it was always a learning process. Now you got to think about it. When the first units went over to Vietnam, they were units that had been uh, trained together, had been together, knew each other and so forth. But as those people were starting to, well, to be honest with you, as they were starting to get wounded, as they were starting to get killed, and their time of duty, the tour of duty was up, we started going back and replacing those people. We were just replacements. Those of us came on later. They were, we were just replacements for the killed and the wounded and those returning back home. You didn't go over as a unit. You went over as an individual, which also had its advantages and disadvantages. One, you were assigned to the unit. You didn't know anybody. They didn't know you. It makes a lonely time. And, again, they kind of stayed away from you because they didn't know how much training you were going to have, have, have and had not had and so forth. So that was an advantage. The one of the nice advantages was you knew you had 12 months unless you extended and you come home. Uh, but in as far as the war itself, I think the 12 months may have been a hindrance. Uh, uh, but we endured it either way. Now let's just talk about the overall things we had to endure. The heat. The heat in Vietnam. Uh, I'm a southerner. I grew up in North Carolina. I had worked in tobacco fields. And I thought, man, I, you know, watch this Vietnam thing. I, I, you know, it's hot over there, but I'm, I've been out in the tobacco fields. And that plane door opened, and the heat came in in that plane. And the first thing I thought was, well, this ain't North Carolina. Humidity? The humidity, I believe you could actually, you know, cut it and part it, uh, wait to walk and so forth. The humidity is unbelievable. Uh, the, the temperature could be 100. The humidity is 100. Uh and when you're humping it through the jungles and so forth, and it's, you get out in the jungle sometimes, and there's no wind whatsoever, there's no air stirring, uh, and the humidity is 100%, it makes it hard to breathe. Uh, and then the smells, oh, the smells were interesting. Uh, you're talking about rotting garbage, uh, diesel fuel, uh, ordnance going off, uh, the hygiene as far as uh, bathroom facilities or, or non-existent. Uh, the rotting garbage uh, created a whole kind of uh, interesting smells, especially after it rained, it rained a little bit and the sun came back out. Uh, the smells for Vietnam were very unique. Uh, one of the things that added to the uh, smells of Vietnam was the uh, sauce that they use on almost everything they eat. It's nook mom. Uh, they call it fermented fish. I call it rotten fish. But you could smell that from probably a couple of miles away. I mean, it was gross stuff. Uh, it was a completely different culture than anything we'd ever experienced before. Uh, how just to talk and, uh, you know, don't touch the kids on the head, how to, how to treat uh, the people uh, because of different religions and so forth, uh, the, the Buddhist and how they worked and so forth, which one of the problems we came into was that we wanted to have areas that were free fire zones that you could bomb or anybody moving around at night. So we took the Buddhist pe uh, people, the whole village, and moved the entire village. But nobody seemed to realize uh, that uh, the Buddhists are very family-oriented. So as soon as you put them in this new village uh, with their uh, goats and, and cows and uh, pigs and so forth, and as soon as we left, they went back to the old place. And then you started bombing, and next thing you know, there were people there. Um, so it was completely different. And in other wars, we fought, we, uh, you gain land, and you move forward, and you move forward, and you move forward. In Vietnam, we never really gained any land. We were there. Uh, we went in and, and made a, set up a base camp, and that's where we were. We went out there during the day. You got in a fight, firefight or whatever, and uh, you fought, and then you uh, went, back to the, went back home to your base camp, or you spent the night uh, in ambush or whatever. Um, that was really hard to understand. You're taking land, losing friends, leaving and come back again and doing it all over again and then doing it again. Uh, a couple of the, uh, really famous battles in Vietnam was the Battle of Doc Tho, uh, eight set, Hill of 875. We lost a lot of good men taking the hill. Uh, as soon as we took the hill, we said, okay, we got it, and we left. And the next day, the hill was right back uh, covered with, with bad guys. Uh, 
that got really frustrating for the young men. Uh, the average age would have been, now to say the average age was about 21 to 23. Now that's taking in as an average, you got to realize there's a lot of uh, uh, career officers there uh, in their uh, 40s, 50s, uh, and so forth who were career military. So a lot of these guys were 18, 19 years old, and it's hard to go back every day to the same place knowing that are you going to die today or one of your friends going to die, and then when it's done, go back and, and go, okay, let's, we'll go back tomorrow and do it again. You start wondering, what the hell am I doing here? What, what's the purpose? What's the goal? Uh, it's nice when you're fighting a war to have a goal. Uh, deciding who were the allies and who the enemy were. Uh, how did you tell the good guys and the bad guys you were fighting a guerrilla war? Uh, basically, what they told me, if they point a rifle at you, they are enemy, and if they don't point a rifle at you, they could still be the enemy. Uh, anytime you dealt with someone, uh, whether in town or whatever, you didn't know uh, if you, what you said didn't end up back and so forth, so you didn't know who the good guys and bad guys were. They all looked alike, and it all sounded alike. Uh, the rules of engagement, the rules of engagement was who you could fight, when you could fight. Uh, they've gotten worse now. But see, we, could, we knew that the communists were sending uh, weapons, food, ammunition, everything they needed by the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which went through Laos and Cambodia, but we couldn't, we couldn't do anything about it. We, never went, we were never allowed to go into North Vietnam. We couldn't uh, bomb uh, parts of North Vietnam because we were afraid the Chinese would get mad. There were some times we couldn't bomb areas where we knew SAM missile sites were because we knew there were Russians there who were training the North Vietnamese how to use these missile sites, and we were afraid we might hit, uh, hit a, uh, kill a Russian. So we were kind of, uh, the, the soldiers' hands were tied to what he could do, uh, and so forth. Uh, it was like if you were being shot at uh, and you were in the Mission River Plantation, you couldn't shoot back without getting permission because you might, a bullet or something might hit a rubber tree and some of that sap would run out. So the rules of engagement was also very frustrating. And going right along with the rules of engagement, the guys on the field were not able to pick what sites that need to be bombed or whatever. The president and his cabinet quite often decided what was to be bombed, especially in North Vietnam, what village was friendly, what village was the enemy. And they're not there. Now, how could they do that? Uh, but they did. They picked the targets. Uh, anytime there were going to be a bombing mission in North Vietnam, the president had to give his okay first. Uh, so there was, uh, there was always a delay in getting things done. The flow of information... Uh, we had lots of intelligence gathering, but it never seemed to go from where we were back up to line to where it was needed to be and then come back down to us as far as action. There wasn't a whole lot of flow of information. Uh, we had to endure uh, the news from home or the lack of news from home. Uh, yes, we got news uh, papers that guys sent. Some uh, You could listen to it on the radio, even though they did censor a lot, uh, the TV and so forth. Uh, I remember I was in Vietnam when Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, doing the riots and so forth. Uh, and I'm going to myself, you know, I'm over here in Vietnam, and I'm more worried about my wife being back in North Carolina, back in, at home, uh, than I am myself over in Vietnam. And that makes it for um, uh, a tough time also to endure. Uh, you're over there fighting for your country. That's what you think you're doing. Uh, and that's why you went there, to fight for your country. And all this stuff's going back home, uh, and you can't come home and, and, and take care of your own family. And, of course, the environment. Uh, Vietnam has basically has two seasons, hot and wet and hot and dry. Uh, Vietnam is a very long country, uh, very narrow. Uh, but if you go above, up into North Vietnam, it gets cool up there. They have four seasons. Uh, not a whole long four, four seasons, but if you go back down to South Vietnam, you have the mountain range, you have kind of like the uh, Piedmont in North Carolina, which is the rice paddies and uh, uh, level land, and then you got down below that into the delta, which is nothing but swamp and rivers and more rice paddies and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, is the uh, wildlife. 
uh, and I want you all get into in just a couple minutes, but also some of the leadership. Um, a lot of officers went to Vietnam for one reason whatsoever. We used to say to get their ticket stamped. If they were a young career officer and they wanted to make sure they got promoted, uh, they almost had to go to Vietnam. Now, I know officers that I work with that on a certain day, they would know a helicopter was going to make a milk run, as we call it. In other words, there was no way it was probably going to get shot at. So they would book themselves on the flight so they could get a, uh, uh, an air medal for a number of hours in, an air, in a helicopter or an airplane, knowing that uh, it looked good on their resume, but it was not in combat, even though it was in Vietnam, so they could get their ticket stamped and make them, their resume look good. So there's a lot of officers out there uh, and there were a lot of good officers. Listen, I worked with some of the best officers in the world uh, in the engineering group. I'm so smart guys, but you did have officers who were there mostly to, uh, as we said, get their um, uh, ticket stamped. And the problem was some of the, the lieutenants were uh, out in the field were getting killed so fast that it was they had to get replaced, and they were not always well trained. Uh, a second lieutenant, we used to say the most dangerous thing in the world is a second lieutenant with a compass and a, and a, a map because they were lost. Now, let's talk about the guy out in the field, the grunt. He soon discovered how difficult it was to search for the enemy through the thick, impenetrable jungle while carrying 65 pounds of supplies on the back. The temperature and humidity were both near 100, 100% and it felt like walking through the largest sauna in the world. His first night was a terrible nightmare. The pitch blackness, limiting visibility to only a foot. His beds were the jungle floor. Roots and stone jabbed at him all through the night. They didn't have a whole lot of cots out there in the middle of the jungle. Jarring him awake each night, he shifted around or turned over. He was so tired, but not sleep on his first night. He knew the enemy was out there. Some were looking for him in every shadow be it leaves, branches, moving during a short breeze, or the moonlight filtering through the canopy and dancing across the vegetation. All this told his brain there's something out there looking for him. He's paralyzed, frozen in place with fear, too afraid to even close his eyes. He prayed for daylight, which was still hours away. He was by far the most terrifying night of his entire life. Guess what tomorrow night's going to do? The same thing. Uh, I, as an engineer, I went out with the 9th ninth, uh, ninth Infantry guys from time to time, and we went out with those guys. Their uniform were rotting off of them from being wet all the time. Of course, they didn't wear underwear because it created all kinds of rashes and so forth. And I talked to a sergeant who had not actually seen a bed in the six months he was in Vietnam. Every night he slept was out there on the jungle floor or in the edge of a rice paddy on the ground. Another fear that these men had to endure while living in the jungles of Vietnam were home to every creature, beast, and insect known to man. Some veterans attest to seeing tigers, elephants in the boonies, wild boars, cobras, small and deadly vipers, snakes, different kind of spiders and bugs and a few boa constrictors, some once, once said Vietnam was, a hunt, was home to 100 different species of snakes. 98 were poisonous, and the other two could swallow you or crush you to death. So all along with the heat and humidity and the bad guys looking for you, you had all those little, uh, you, it was like living in a zoo. Tarantulas and other species of spiders. I mean, some big spiders. Some the size of dinner plates. Red ants, oh, listen, when they bite you, they just take out a piece of meat. Black horse flies, all hurt like hell when they bit. Bees, wasps, hornets, centipedes, millipedes, lizards, frogs, rats, scorpion, land and water leeches, orangutans, spider monkeys, bats, and hordes of mosquitoes. Oh, listen, I, I could have sworn the mosquitoes were out there where had um, uh, call signs on their, on their tails like airplanes. Um, and, I don't, and when you, they gave us insect repellent, and you could pour all you want to on the skin. They still bite you through the, by your clothes. I mean, they were vicious. Now, I want, to try, I want you to try an experiment for me. Pretend you're out in this jungle. It's nighttime, and there's no moon. 
Now I want you to close your eyes. Keep them closed for a minute. What do you see? If you, got, if you did what you're supposed to, you don't see anything. Well, that's kind of what it like being out in the jungle at night, knowing that you're on an ambush patrol or you're waiting for somebody to come down the trail so they could shoot you or you could shoot them. And it's a whole lot better if you shoot them first. So what are you seeing? Nothing. That is exactly what you saw in the jungles of Vietnam at night. Another heart stopper is when you felt something moving across your body during the night. There were no lights to turn on or flashlights available to investigate. Besides, any light in the dark jungle would be a beacon to those who wanted to kill you. You took your chance and either swatted, brushed, jumped up from the ground, or just left it alone. Some of these creatures had claws that gripped you, swatting at them usually pissed them off and resulted in retaliatory bite, sting, or pinch. Most of the above were poisonous and could be made one very sick or even kill. So you're sitting there and you're sitting there waiting to ambush somebody and something crawls over you and you can't do anything about it because you can't make any noise. Now this is one of my yucks. The leeches. Oh, the leeches were mean. They like the warm, soft, moist areas of your body. That's the area that you find between your waist and your knees. And they they are so, you can look down and, all, and there's nothing, and, and just a second you can look right back down and there's one that's got you and you swallow them to a big ball. Or you look down, there's blood all over your uniform because this blood sucker's got you. Uh, we crossed a stream one day, and uh, the guy walking in front of me uh, had 14 leeches we had to burn off of him when we got the other side. You can't pull them off because the head comes off, and you got almost instant infection, so you have to either put the um, uh, insect repellent that we got or uh, take a match or a cigarette and stick to the button to let go. Uh, they aren't deadly, but I tell you what, they're number one in the yuck factor. And there's one of those famous mosquitoes, one of those famous uh, blood-sucking uh, mosquitoes that were in swarms that you could, I mean, just, you would not, just the roar of the mosquitoes flying around you and so forth with the malaria and other diseases they carried. And uh, uh, they were terrible. And one of the things that uh, I'm glad I didn't run across, because uh, this is something that really scares, and I, normally snakes doesn't bother me a whole lot, but a cobra. Uh, I know a couple guys that saw them. Uh, 30,000 Vietnamese farmers get bitten each year by snakes. We don't know how many of them live or die, but the cobras, some of them 14 feet or so forth. Uh, can you think of sitting out there in that jungle with your uh, in the dark and thinking about the cobra that you may have saw earlier uh, and then something crawls across you? Uh, I wouldn't have to, good thing I didn't you didn't have on underwear. And then another one of my favorites. Now I had to go to this picture, the rats of Vietnam. And if you'll notice right there, Mama Son has got some pretty good sized rats there on the table that she's got uh, pre roasted. So you go pick you up a rat and gnaw on during the day. Uh, the rats are or uh, they won't scare them much of anything. Uh, you could be I woke up one night inside my bunk, inside a mosquito net, and there was a rat in there with me. And I still can't figure out how he got in. I know how I got out. Uh, but they were just, especially the places were like uh, base camps. They were just, um, they were in everything and ate everything. And uh, they were terrible. Uh, but Mama Son and Papa Son always liked to catch them because they'd take them home and have them for dinner. Uh, as you can see, Mama Son there, she's got some already cooked, uh, pre-cooked, so you could you know, be riding by in your Jeep and stop by and get you a nice rat or a rat burger. And uh, another thing they had was the pit vipers. Uh, one of the uh, snakes they had over there, we used to call Two Steps. He was a little green snake, and he bit you, and they said you uh, had about two steps before you, that's the reason they called him Two Steps, before you fell dead. He affected your uh, uh, bloodstream or nervous system. And that's another viper. This one is the Mayan pit viper, which I'm glad I also didn't see. I did see a two-step. And to give you another idea of some of the uh, bugs and so forth, there's a spider. And what you see that guy's arm, that is actually a 12-inch long bug. That is a big bug. And the tarantulas, they say tarantulas will not hurt you. But I tell you what, if I'm sitting out there in the jungle in the dark, 
and one crawls up my neck, uh, he may not bite me and hurt me, but I'm going to have a heart attack. I tell you, I just, uh, spiders. Now, the next one, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, that's a locust. I mean, he'd probably make a nice meal for somebody. I mean, you can see Vietnam grows little people and big everything else, as I've said. And y'all know what a millipede is, don't you? Y'all have them around here, the little, little bugs. Well, that's a Vietnam millipede. Uh, kind of give you an idea. Now, I understand that they bite you, they wouldn't kill you, but they wouldn't make you sick. Uh, but that was another thing to be sitting there and he run across your leg. I do remember one not that big running across my leg when I was sitting out uh, having uh, my sea rations one day in the jungle. He was about half that size, but uh, he definitely got my attention anyway. Uh, so, And also, the next one is the tigers. Now, this is a small tiger. That you could also, I have heard stories and people swear to it that people were on ambush patrol. They were out there waiting for somebody to come down the uh, trail so they could uh, ambush them. And the tiger would actually go in and do the, everybody got to be quiet. So the tigers would actually go in and grab a soldier and start dragging him off uh, before everybody realized what was going on and shot the tiger. Uh, I've seen footprints this big, uh, I mean, big footprints of uh, where tigers have been. I mean, they are, uh, th this one's a little bitty one. This one's a baby tiger, but that's some of the things. Uh, another nice thing we had to endure, uh, especially if you're down in the Delta area, uh, jungle rot. Uh, you were always wet. You were always wet at all. And if you're really lucky, uh, you had dry socks uh, that you could change to from time to time and, and then put them on the other one in your uh, back of your rucksack or whatever to let them dry. But you didn't always have an opportunity to get uh, clean, uh, dry socks. Uh, and you end up with uh, jungle rot, trench rot, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it got, and I don't know many people who were in Vietnam who were down in the Delta area who do not have uh, uh, some uh, uh, jungle rot. Let me read you what uh, a, a Vietnam veteran says here. A Vietnam veteran discussing his foot problem. When I got back from the Nam, I had a bad case of the rot. I tried everything to cure it. My feet smelled like rotting meat, and I had holes eaten to them between my toes and down to the meat. Uh, one of the most important things you had to do was to keep your feet as dry as you could. The jungle boots uh, would, would not hold the water because they had uh, holes in them to drain out, but it was also uh, cloth. So it also let the water come in. So uh, it was always good to uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, change socks. You didn't, may not have to worry about underwear or whatever and your uniform run off, Bobby, but you didn't want to take care of your feet. Now, I still remember this. It's funny now. The first time I remember out in the jungle, uh, I'm a little apprehensive. And I look up through the trees, and the Viet Cong were swinging through the trees off in the distance. And I hollered to the 9th Infantry Sergeant, Sergeant, there they are. And he looked at me and said, no, stupid. Those are the monkeys. Hey, I look like men going through the trees to me. And I've heard stories of the rock ape. I never saw one, thank goodness. Uh, you, we, have, we call them Bigfoot here, I think. The rock pile. Monkey Mountain had its name, which was a mountain right outside from uh, Da Nang. It was called Monkey Mountain because there are monkeys there. Uh, let me read this to you. I think it's pretty interesting. One evening sometime in 1967, Marines from the 4th Marine Regiment were assaulted by a large number of rock apes who were said to inhabit the caves in the area. The Marines fought back in prolonged burst of fire plow, which lit up the night in the morning. They were allegedly corpses of the ape-like creatures strewn about, and they were included in the sitrep briefing body count. This incident sounds very much like the battle between Marines and the Rock Apes that occurred on Hill 868 in the Battle of Dong Den, which was claimed to have left bodies of the dead beast in its wake. They would come in and whole tribes, or whatever you want to call them, uh, you throw something at them, which I used to tease the Marines that the reason they were in Vietnam for 13 months because it took them that long to explain why they shouldn't throw grenades at the Rock Apes, because the Rock Apes would pick it up and throw it back at you. Uh, but they were, had been known to uh, come in groups and attack the soldiers and so forth. And you can see it in the picture, uh, they were pretty good-sized apes. 
Another thing we had to endure uh, going through the war and so forth, there's the first M16s. You wonder how many men died as a result of the M16s jamming, what I'll start with. See, the military, in its infinite wisdom, decided the M16 was the new rifle for everybody. So they bought the M16 from the uh, inventor, but they thought his uh, bullets with, their, with his low uh, residue powder cost too much. They need cleaning oil. They already had cleaning oil. Why do they need to buy his cleaning oil? Which is why as soon as you got a little bit of dirt or moisture in the M16, it jammed up. The problem was that the bullets they were using, or the shells, had high residue powder left over. So that high residue gunked up, I guess gunked is a word, uh, but it gunked up and it jammed up the rifle. So finally they got the idea and started using the uh, low, low uh, residue uh, gunpowder and the different gun oil. And then the M16, uh, one I understand, was a pretty wet, good weapon. I only carried a 14 the whole time I was there. I know the M16 was a lot lighter and a whole lot easier to use. Uh, but um, uh, learning stage. Uh, we all went through a learning stage. And you, you just how many men lost their lives uh, and a lot of times they would pick up the AK-47s of the enemy uh, and start using them, but then you also had a problem. They made distinct different sounds. If you picked up the AK-47 and started firing that, and then the uh, good guys, your buddies who can't see you, hear that going off, they don't know it's you. They shoot over there where that sound's coming from, and you can get shot by your own guys. Now, one of the other things as far as the environment of Vietnam is the heat and humidity. Now, if you were in South Vietnam, uh, you basically had the two seasons, hot, wet, and hot, and dry. Now, according to this thing, the average minimum and maximum temperature in Ho Chi Minh City, now, this is minimum maximum, average. It's not the daily. Uh, so the, right here, it looks like it's just under 100, and the minimum is down to about 70. 70 and 65 and 70 is a cold day. That's the that's the minimum and average. So you can think about that some days it's a whole lot more than 100, and some days it probably got down. I remember it got down to 65 one time, and I like to froze to death as the heat. And, of course, if you don't have the heat, you got the monsoons. There is nothing dry during the monsoons. Nothing is dry. And I never liked the ponchos because I found out when I put on the poncho, it was so hot, and the weather was so hot, that I soaked anyway, so I might as well go without the poncho. But at night, uh, you want to put that poncho on because it got down chilly at night. But the monsoon seasons, uh, just we just had uh, the hurricane uh, come through here, and we basically had some monsoon rains, and we got lots of flooding going on. A lot of people in North Carolina right now are hurting. Uh, 12 to 15 inches of rain. Uh, just it caused all kinds of floods. Well, 12 inches of rain was not unheard of on, uh, in Vietnam during the monsoon season. Now, this is what created a problem uh, during the monsoon season. All that nice dirt would turn into mud. This was gr crazy stuff. This land was kind of a sandy soil up to about nine inches deep. And if you broke through that, it was this jelly. It was almost like uh, jello. The land, you just go in there and shake it. And uh, we kind of stuck up this uh, armored personnel carrier one day. In fact, we stuck up, we brought one in to get this one out and stuck that one too. Uh, that was an interesting time. And of course, during the dry season, you could have, you could have eight, nine inches of nothing but powder, powdered dirt. And this one is a helicopter going by, but I remember sometimes being out and a, a heavy equipment grader go by and he would, you couldn't even see him. You just knew he went by, but the, the dirt and dust was so thick. So it was either a uh, feast or famine when it comes to monsoon and dirt during the dry season. Another thing we had to endure over there was a spraying of defoliants. Now, the idea was we saved a lot of American soldiers by spraying these defoliants. Uh, what they would do is, uh, a lot, especially along the rivers, uh, they would spray these um, defoliants uh, called Agent Orange, Agent Blue, Agent White, 
and where they got their names from was basically the chemical makeup, and it was labeled by the color, the uh, stripe on the barrel. And I remember getting sprayed. It was kind of oily spray, and they always said, don't worry about it. It won't hurt you. And uh, that's the story for a little bit farther on down the line and so forth, but getting sprayed. But uh, to give you an idea of what it looked like getting sprayed was – a couple of days before, this was right along the river. This was nice, lots of vegetation and so forth, and you can see it killed everything. It just desolated in areas and so forth. The only problem was that today we're finding out that the spraying of Agent Orange is causing a great number of deaths, illnesses with Vietnam vets, but What's even worse to me is our children and our grandchildren who had no choice about going to Vietnam whatsoever because they didn't go. We are bringing back the diseases and they're showing up in our, in our children and grandchildren on down. But that stuff won't hurt you, uh, we were told. And today there's, uh, there's presumptive diseases, there's uh, I forgot how many of them there are, but it's a, a lots of different diseases. Automatically, if you are a veteran of Vietnam and you come down with a disease, it's considered an Agent Orange. Um, yes, we uh, probably saved a lot of lives at the time, but you wonder about the lives we saved at the time as the lives we're losing now. Uh, Admiral Zumwalt, who ordered the spraying of Agent Orange, I guess he was told also that it wouldn't hurt you. Um, he lost his son to Agent Orange. His, agent, his son was going up and down the Brown Water Navy, up and down the uh, rivers of Vietnam, and he died as a result of Agent Orange. Uh, so he definitely paid a price for it, even though uh, he felt at the time that he was um, trying to do the thing. Another thing was really tough to endure was being in Vietnam and seeing the news what was going on back home. In 1968, the Charlotte riots in the USA were sparked by in part by the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. He was shot while standing on the balcony of his room at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4, 1968 at 6.01 p.m. Violence and chaos followed, with blacks flooding out in the streets of major cities. Soon riots began primarily in black urban areas. Over 100 major U.S. cities experienced disturbances resulting in roughly $50 million in damage. I remember exactly where I was standing uh, when I heard on the radio that Martin Luther King was assassinated, and then I started to see on the news and the newspapers and the information coming back from home about the riots and so forth, and I'm in Vietnam, and I can't come home to look out for my wife and my family, and I can tell you it was frustrating in hell to realize that I'm over there fighting for my country, and my country is over, over in my home fighting. Uh, you, you start wondering, uh, just what am I doing here? Why are we in this country? And another thing we had to endure was Vietnam vets coming home from Vietnam. Like John Kerry sitting there, our Secretary of State. John Kerry gave himself three Purple Hearts for wounds that he inflicted basically himself, the Band-Aid would take care of. But he came home, and he helped start an organization called Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And here he is testifying before Congress about all the atrocities we did in Vietnam, all the children we killed and all the women we raped and all the, thing, the bad things the American soldier did in Vietnam. He had other people with him who stood up and made statements to Congress about all the things that the American soldiers were doing in Vietnam. Bad. And then later it was found out that a lot of those people that were standing up that he brought in to that's for Congress had never been to Vietnam, had no idea what they were talking about. But John was also financed by another friend of ours, Jane Fonda, and... He probably hurt the Vietnam veterans coming home as much as anybody. He wrote a book called The Winter Soldiers. And to me, he is as dis disgusting as to, me, to me as Jane Fonda and maybe some ways more because he was one of us for a brief time that he came home. 
But there's uh, proof that the Vietnam veterans uh, against the war actually had a meeting where they discussed killing a number of congressmen. John Kerry said he was there, but he was, did not take part in the discussion. Uh, not going to go into just how guilty that is, but uh, you can come up with your own. And I suggest that you go out and do some research, and you can find the same things I've just told you. Uh, another thing that uh, was the problems going on at the universities, they're protesting. Uh, Kent State, it was absolute tragedy. Uh, it shouldn't have happened. Uh, you had young National Guard there, uh, which I'm surprised that uh, the young National Guard guys actually had uh, uh, bullets in their weapons and so forth. Uh, this young lady is squatting down there. She was actually a runaway. Nobody, her parents didn't know where she was uh, when the students were shot by the National Guard. Uh, nobody knows where the, where the bullets came from, the original shot came from, whether it was the National Guard or somebody else. But the National Guard guys were scared to death, the students were scared to death, and unfortunately, um, some of the students were killed uh, during that. The next picture is a uh, movie star, daughter of a, of a famous uh, hero movie star whose her, her father also served in the military. It's our own Jane Fonda, uh, Hanoi Jane as we call her. This is a picture of Jane Fonda sitting in Hanoi at an aircraft gun waiting for the blonde-haired, blue-eyed murderers to come in so that you could be shot them down. Now, how would you like to be a soldier in Vietnam? Well, let's go even a little farther. You are a POW. You were in an airplane that got shot down. And you see a respected movie star, the wife, excuse me, the daughter of one of your heroes growing up, Henry Fonda sitting in an air and aircraft gun in Hanoi, telling how wonderful the, the communists were and how bad you were, how would that make you feel? And, of course, what I mentioned a while ago about what John Kerry said, yes, some atrocities happened in Vietnam. But if you know anything about an American soldier, they love the kids and the children and, 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 and the people who can't take care of themselves um, and wherever we go. Uh, we built orphanages, schools, we took care of the children, we gave them food and so forth. But if you remember a while ago, I talked about the leadership. They were losing and were having to replace second lieutenants so fast that they were making almost anybody who would stand up and would make them a second lieutenant. William Callie was a second lieutenant leading a squad this is the same squad who went by this village every day and something happened. Young men, 19, 21 years old, got in a mob state of mind because of lack of leadership, and they killed these women and children, just slaughtered them. Just, uh, there's no way other to put it. Uh, it was terrible. It shouldn't have happened. With le but good leadership, it wouldn't have happened. And there's probably some other events went on like this, but by and far... The soldier in Vietnam uh, did not do all this, uh, come home. But My Lai is out there. Now, every year, the communists celebrate and recognize My Lai, the massacre at My Lai. Now, an American soldier, Hugh Thompson, flying a helicopter, saw what was going on and landed his helicopter between the surviving the survivors of the My Lai village and the soldiers and said, we will shoot the next man who shoots anybody. So an American soldier stopped it from happening. I can't imagine that door gunner sitting in that helicopter going, what am I going to do if somebody shoot? I can't shoot one of my own guys. But that's what he was told. But during the Tet Offensive, the, Cong the communists killed 4,000 of their own men, women, and children, starting with the teachers and uh, uh, political people, and mass buried them in a, gra in a mass grave in way. But they never mentioned that part. And this picture kind of gives you what it was like day after day. Uh, you patrolled all day and you ambushed all night and to the point of almost total exhaustion. You didn't eat the best in the world. 
you own ambush at night and you took a break wherever you could have it and any you could imagine the places that you could find to curl up in and and take a nap and so forth so the helicopter that wonderful helicopter there's some good things and some bad things about the helicopter over 10% of all combat and combat support deaths in Vietnam occurred in helicopter operations. A combined total of 6,175, which is 2,202 pilots, 2,704 aircraft, and 1,269 passengers. About 80% of these casualties were United States Army. In addition to human costs, the helicopter casualties of the war were staggering. A total of 11,800 helicopters of all types served in Vietnam. Approximately 5,000 helicopters were destroyed. Now, but the wonderful thing about the helicopter all was, also was that if you were wounded, you knew that, that those guys would go through hell to come get you and take you to the hospital. How in the world a dust-off pilot could sit there would with bullets going through his glass canopy, sit there and hold that helicopter still while your buddies loaded your wounded butt onto that helicopter to get you to hospital. Another good, great thing about the helicopter was if you were in deep, you know what, and they could fly in and, and shoot their guns and rockets and give you some uh, support. It was also good sometimes that you didn't have to walk through the jungles and have to worry about getting ambushed because they would take you in. But a problem that the helicopter caused was this. In World War II, the average soldier saw three to four months of actual combat. They would, you would go in and fight for 30 days. They'd pull you back in the line, resupply you, put your replacements and so forth. But in Vietnam, because of the helicopter would take you in to a, a battle site, you may fight and they come back and pick you up and take you back to a camp to spend the night and maybe take you back out the next day to the same place to do it all over again, that the average combat soldier in Vietnam saw 240 days of combat. So, but I, I really think that the guys who uh, depend on the helicopter would appreciate the helicopter, even though they did cause them more uh, to do. Now, let's talk about a little bit of the things uh, some of the uh, pilots had to endure. This is a picture of a North Vietnamese anti-aircraft. Oh, and actually, this is a, a picture of um, uh, Sam Missile. Crew of North Vietnamese SA-2 missile site deploying some of the most advanced missile technology of the era. In the war's early years, U.S. policymakers refused to hit some sites under construction for fear of Soviet or Chinese reactions. Some of the exempted missile batteries were too late or later to shoot down an American aircraft. We were afraid, even though we knew where they were going, our leadership was afraid to go in and, and, and bomb and blow them up because we might make the Russians or the Chinese mad. Isn't that a hell of a way to fight a war? Um, then we got into the problem was Americans didn't want to kill civilians. We started to bomb in Hanoi. What our government did was they went and told the Swiss that we were going to bomb Hanoi tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning, knowing that the Swiss would go tell Hanoi that we were going to be bombing Hanoi tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So if you were a sound missile operator or an anti-aircraft gun, you could take your break as long as you had it done before 10 o'clock because you knew the Americans were coming in. Now, we flew the same schedules, the same routes every day. Almost never got buried. So they all they had to do was put the uh, sand missiles and so forth right down a certain line because they knew you were coming in that way, which is why we had a lot of uh, uh, airmen shot down, which you'll see in the next picture. This is a picture right outside Hanoi of one of our American planes getting shot down. This results of our government decided we didn't want to make the Russians and Chinese mad. Now, here's some guys out for a nice... Refreshing hike. Uh, uh, this wasn't necessarily during the monsoon season, but you, uh, if you're down in the Delta area, uh, the way you got somewhere, you walk through the water, through the rivers and so forth. 
Uh, if you were in a, a little farther up north or and still in South Vietnam, you walk through the rice paddies. And if you're a little bit farther up and, and on the in Central Highlands, you walk the mountains and so forth. Uh, uh, so wherever you were, you uh, had to uh, interesting uh, little situations. Uh, so you had the swamps of Vietnam, the jungles of Vietnam, and the mountains of Vietnam. And another interesting thing of Vietnam was this elephant grass. Uh, you can see the blonde head, uh, blonde headed guy in there probably. Uh, if he takes another step, he'll disappear. You could be walking through this stuff and somebody shoot at you. You have no idea where they're coming from. And it's hot in Vietnam, as we talked about, and the humidity. But when you go through elephant grass, you're going to unroll your sleeves because this stuff is like razors. It will cut you all to pieces uh, as you went through it. Um, that was always interesting. Then you sweat, and that salt water off your sweat running those little cuts and keep your attention. And uh, one of the things we had to endure was the sea rations we ate. Uh, which left over from uh, Korea and uh, World War II. And this was the one that uh, nobody liked. It was ham and lima, hams and lima and bean juice. Even the Vietnamese kids most of the time didn't like these. You could put all the Tabasco, ketchup, or whatever you wanted to it, and it's still terrible. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, this was an, uh, a day out in the jungle, come back in. It got a little bit, I got a little bit of dry there. That's uh, me coming back, uh, coming back to camp after playing out in the jungle for the day. And living conditions uh, were not the best in the world. You uh, dug a hole in the ground, and you put sandbags all over it. And the only problem was, you remember that monsoon we talked about, and it rained 12 inches of rain and so forth? Well, guess where the water goes? It always goes to the lowest area, and that's that hole you dug. Um, but you can see these guys were, this is some of the Marines at Quezon. That's got some of the reddish, dirty, dirt you have ever seen. I mean, it's, we got red clay in North Carolina, but nothing compared to the red mud of, of Quezon and so forth. So the living conditions were not always the best in the world. Now, you had guys who slept in nice barracks. Uh, some people I even understood had air conditioning. Uh, not me. Uh, and just take care of the daily stuff, hygiene. You see he's standing in front of his, uh, his hole that he lives in, and he's uh, getting ready to shave, and that's probably very cold water. He's getting ready to shave in right there in his mud and so forth, getting ready for the day. And toilet facilities were uh, interesting. This guy really, uh, did you see a guy sitting in the toilet there? This was a nice one. Uh, this one's got ventilation and so forth. Uh, I've seen them worse, and I've seen them a lot better. And one of the things that somebody had to do every day was pull those barrels out of the back of that thing and burn it. And you had to endure the smells and so forth of going with that. But at least the mosquitoes left you alone when you were doing that. But some lucky soldier got to burn that crap every day. Uh, if you're out uh, in some of the base camps and so forth. And now, some of the things you missed. Well, wouldn't it have been home, nice to have been home, sitting down with mom and dad, opening up presents and your, your brothers and sisters. Uh, you missed, we missed Thanksgiving. Some of the guys missed the birth of their children, wedding, graduations, the funeral of a friend or, or relatives, the birthdays of your parents, your birthday, the anniversaries, ball games, wives and girlfriends, parents. How about just getting out one day and, and going cruising in your car? We used to cruise back then. You go ride, ride around and around restaurants and, and, and bars and so forth in the car, cruising. Well, up down the streets where the radio's going full back. Um, how about a real glass of cold milk or your favorite food? Most guys didn't see that subtle stuff the year in in Vietnam. Now, let's talk about the end of the war. The United States pulled out in 73. Now, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I don't want to go too much over time. They pulled out in 73. Vietnam fought very well for two more years. But Congress, the United States Congress, passed the Cooper Church Amendment, which said we could not do anything to help South Vietnam. Now, these were guys fighting communism, which we said we were trying to stop. We couldn't send them a Band-Aid. Our military was not even allowed to go countries next to them. Gerald Ford made a speech to Congress going, we've got to help these people. We've got them going in this war, and we've got to help them 
or they're going to lose. Congress got up and walked out on him during the speech. This is the North Vietnamese Army tanks. There were 700 of them on the road in, 19, in April 30th, 1975, when they come into Saigon and burst through the gates. Now, how would you like to be a Vietnam veteran and you went over there and you endured all that you just went through for Congress to pull out, break the promises that, I, that we made in the peace treaty and cause these people to lose their country because of politics? I tell you what, it was like, what the hell was I, why did I, why did I go? Why did I spend my year in Vietnam uh, when the, the day this happened? Um, Let's talk about coming home. Uh, depending on what years you were coming home, when I got ready to come home, they told me, don't wear a uniform when you get there. But coming home, dressed in my new uniform, because when you got in, back in the United States, they gave you all nice new uniform, fit and everything with your badges and your stripes and so forth. I was ready to be welcomed home by the local populace. I mean, I'm a soldier coming home. I'm a hero. I went out fighting for my country who had gathered outside the air base. Every one of us were looking forward to sharing the love. Instead of finding love, we were bombarded with hate. People stood on the side of the road holding signs condemning the war and us returning veterans. They chanted slogans as groups and yelled insults as we were passed. Once the bus began pulling away, tomatoes, eggs fell from the sky, splattering across the windows. All of us in the bus sat quietly, shocked, jaws agape. Unable to believe what had just happened. Welcome to the new world. It didn't happen everywhere. But then they didn't know how to separate the soldier from the war. We were blamed for what was going on in the war. The soldiers coming home. We were treated like outcasts. Blamed for what we didn't start. Accused of killing innocent women and children. Called dopeheads spit at and ridiculed by citizens most of the way. Don't get me wrong, I did meet some very generous and friendly people on the way, but they were solely the minority and few and far in between. Some uniformed soldiers were missing limbs, were jeered at and told they deserved their fate. I know it's going to be hard for you to believe, but there were soldiers who lost their life in Vietnam that some of these protesters called their parents and said, we're glad your son got killed in Vietnam. Isn't it wonderful? When arriving home, I was dumbfounded, ashamed, and depressed about all our treatment. So this is a thank you for putting our lives on the line and for sacrificing what we did during the past year. I began questioning myself. Was I, fight, was I right in going to fight in Vietnam, or did I make the wrong decision? I soon discovered that it was better to not advertise and just keep quiet. Don't tell anybody you're a Vietnam vet. The news media continued to inflame the public opposition to the Vietnam War by broadcasting distorted and biased accounts from the battlefield, reporting that the use of drugs in Vietnam was escalating, increased incidents of soldiers refusing direct orders to go out on patrols, and the military inflating body counts and misleading the public on the war. So the warriors were blamed for the war. Clearly, it was an unpopular war for someone to be a Vietnam veteran or even a member of the military. And if you hadn't gone to Vietnam, you were wearing a uniform. In the 1970s, Vietnam veterans were discriminated against for jobs, publishing books of the war experience, and referred to as the social delinquents of our society. Even the VFWs and American legions didn't want us and refused to allow us to join because we were the first veterans to have lose the war. It seems like every movie about Vietnam to that point portrayed the veteran as a killing machine with mental problems, bad marriages, hooked on drugs, or alcoholics. That was what the American soldier coming back from Vietnam endured. For you, it's news. For me, it was reality. You call for pizzas. I call for medics. You watch construction. I performed destruction. You watch children play. I watched them die. You learned, uh, you learned of life. I learned of death. Your passion was to succeed. Mine was to survive. You served Derna. I served my country. You forgot I can't. And just this last one here, uh, I thought was very uh, profound. 
Not everyone who lost his life in Vietnam died there. Not everyone who came home from Vietnam ever left there. There's a lot of men who came home and their life was completely destroyed by what they went through in Vietnam. War is a terrible thing, as we talked about before. Yes, civilians were killed. Some of these men came home, and it was a civilian killed in a fight that they had no control over whatsoever. A child picked up a rifle and started shooting back at you. What are you going to do? The child gets killed. But that child stays with you the rest of your life. So... Not everyone came home alive and didn't die there. It was not with them. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show on what we endured. Uh, if you want to add some things to it, I'd be glad to uh, uh, send us an email and so forth. Looking forward to our next show. I can't tell you right now uh, who our guest is going to be, but I'm trying to get us a guest. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Looking forward to in two weeks for our next show. Um, Again, I want to thank Amnon uh, Nissan for uh, his studios and his hard work and keeping me light and straight and so forth. Uh, have a good night. And for those of you out there uh, waiting for the rivers to crest and flooded, uh, our prayers are with you. And hopefully uh, things get back to whatever normal is for you uh, soon. God bless. Good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.